All right, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for our segment of Be the Bank, looking at how to lend money out of your self-directed IRA. A little bit about myself before we get started. My name is Alex Perney. I'll be your presenter today. I've worked with Advanta since 2012. I'm a graduate of Eckerd College down here in sunny St. Pete. I'm a member of the American Banking Association, and I attained my Certified IRA Services Professional, or CISP, designation in 2014. Um, so I am I'm very knowledgeable on any of the topics that we will cover today and many that we will not. So if you do have any questions regarding anything with self-directed IRAs, not just about lending, but if you have questions about private placements, about real estate, or anything else that you can come up in, in a creative manner that you'd like to invest in, please feel free to ask me because I can more than likely answer your question. A little disclaimer before we get started, Advanta and our employees do not provide investment advice or endorse any products. All information today provided is for informational purposes only. We encourage you strongly to get a qualified opinion of a investment professional such as a CPA or an attorney before entering into any type of financial transaction. A bit about Advanta and our history. We've been administering self-directed retirement accounts since 2004. Uh, we're local to the uh, Clearwater area, but we do extend that uh, local feel to all of our clients, whether they are near our Georgia office or anywhere in the world or United States. We have a very flexible fee schedule than most custodians, and we try to work with you to make sure that we can help you keep your costs low to maximize profits. And our only business is self-directed IRAs. We don't handle any sort of traditional brokerages, such as stocks, bonds, or mutual funds. We maintain a streamlined process so you can be as creative as you want in self-directing your own retirement plan. A few key points that I'd like you to take away from today's presentation is that any type of IRA or former employer plan will qualify to be self-directed. So you're not just restricted if you only have an IRA to be able to self-direct that. If you have an old 401k, a governmental 457, an old pension, any of those types of plans can be self-directed, and we'll get into more of the specifics in a moment. You can choose any investment that you'd like so long as that it is not one of the two unallowable types of investments or you're not doing it with a disqualified individual. And all expenses must be paid from your IRA and all income is received by the IRA for the investment that you choose as well. Some people might question why they haven't heard about self-directed IRAs. And the big reason is that the big banks that have a vested interest in selling you products don't want to allow you to invest in things that they don't have any way to make money on, such as real estate. Raymond James, Charles Schwab don't have a portfolio of real estate to sell you within an IRA. However, they do have stocks and mutual funds that they sell you, and that's how they make their money. Um, there's limited investment with that. So by inherent of the fact that they have a very small line of investing for you, they're not going to give you the broad types of investments that we are going to allow you to do and get creative with. The rules do, however, allow for any type of investment that you'd like to do, such as I mentioned before, so long as that they are not going to be violating any sort of rules of the IRS with regard to the type of investment or who you're dealing with, then you're pretty much free to do what you'd like. Um, and also self-direction makes up about less than 4% of all IRA investments. Uh, that 4% does include the people like Fidelity and E-Trade that allow you to invest in self-directed quote-unquote, that is you picking your own stocks. Um, this is a very small segment of the actual marketplace. So uh, thank you very much for wanting to educate yourselves on this uh, very awesome opportunity to really expand the type of investing and really truly diversify your retirement savings. So today we're going to be focusing mainly on lending. However, there are a much broader spectrum of different types of assets you can invest with with regard to your IRA accounts that you would hold with Advanta. Some of the types of paper assets that we see a lot of are mortgage loans, tax liens, unsecured notes to you know really whomever you'd like to issue one to with the exception of certain family members, uh, corporate debenture notes, option contracts, assignments, joint venturing, you can even purchase accounts receivable from a company if you'd like to do that and then receive income streams in that manner as well. So there's different types of private lending. Um, as some of you may or may not know, some of the more traditional types um, is the traditional mortgage, as you might have with your own house. You would 
an investor would come to you and say, I'd like to borrow money. Your IRA would then lend them in first position mortgage, either a 15, 30, uh, a five year with a one year adjustable rate mortgage, a balloon note. Um, the list kind of goes on with regard to how you would actually be investing these types of funds within a lending structure. Uh, you could do short-term transactional funding, a bridge loan to someone that maybe needs to finish a rehab on a real estate project. Uh, you could do an unsecured personal promissory note. Uh, there can be equity participation and joint venturing. We'll actually have a case study about equity participation, but in short, that is where you would lend someone money for a project whether it be real estate or something else. And then in lieu of a actual interest rate, you will participate in the actual growth and equity at the sale of the asset. And then secured notes, uh, they can be secured by really anything. Uh, farm equipment, automobiles, we've even seen some people do livestock uh, in different fashions, forms, and other things like that. So it doesn't necessarily just have to be real estate. You can get creative with what you secure your loan by. However, we do encourage that you make sure you follow all proper recording steps to make sure that your asset is protected. Some other types of alternatives that we also see uh, are LLCs in different forms, such as people forming them under the IRA to then in turn do their investing, buying membership of an existing LLC. The list really kind of goes on with the different creative types of LLC investments you can get involved with. You can do equipment leasing. We've had many clients that got into doing rentals of ATM, so like the ones that you would see in a gas station, they would purchase that and then a leasing company would lease them to the gas station to hold them in their Forex accounts, private stock, private banks, different types of people that are issuing uh, private debt for to raise capital for their institutions. You can certainly purchase within an IRA. Certain types of precious metals as well are also allowable. And uh, we've been seeing an increase in different types of different oil and gas investments. So please don't just understand that even though we will be focusing mainly on lending today, that the scope of what you can do with an Advanta IRA is much broader. To get into the different types of accounts that you can self-direct. So as I mentioned before, and the, one of the main points, actually the first main point that I want you to take away from today, is that any type of old retirement account, not just simply an IRA, can be self-directed. So the most common two types of IRAs are going to be your traditional and Roth. A traditional IRA being a deductible contribution and a Roth IRA being a non-deductible contribution type account. You also have employer-based IRAs. You have the SEP IRA, which is a simplified employer pension, and then you also have the SIMPLE, which I think is horribly named because it's anything but SIMPLE, which is a savings incentive match for employers, can also be self-directed as well. You can, can self-direct a qualified plan, such as a 401k or a profit-sharing plan. You can also do individual 401ks, which we handle in-house here at Advanta. So if you're a self-employed individual and want to take advantage of a SEP or a 401k, we can handle all that in-house for you as well. Any type of former employer plan via a direct rollover can also be used in a self-directed IRA. So if you have a 401k from an old employer, let's say you worked for IBM, or you worked for the Parks Department of Clearwater and you had a governmental 403b, 457s and any other types of pensions can also be rolled into an IRA and self-directed as well. Although not as highly promoted or used, you can also do an education savings account and a health savings account in a self-directed fashion as well. Uh, for some investors that are using these to help with their deductions and their personal in their personal finances and are contributing into these and want to have them for more of an investment type of account, you can certainly self-direct those as well. <clears throat> so some of the basics of a traditional IRA. Anyone with earned income can contribute into a traditional IRA. However, there are phase outs for your deductibility. So if you're making a million dollars a year, you're not going to get a deduction for putting in money to the traditional IRA. However, you certainly still can add it in. The benefits currently would be that you're lowering your current tax bill and that you're seeing a tax deferred growth. So you're getting a deduction and you're not paying any taxes on the actual growth of the funds at that time. The impetus being is that you will be in a lower tax bracket when you finally retire. So taking money out then would potentially get you a better tax savings than paying the taxes on it currently potentially at a higher tax rate. 
any form of 401k or any of the employer sponsored plans with the very few of exceptions that have Roth components can be rolled directly into a traditional IRA without any tax consequences. So you're going to not see any sort of early withdrawal penalties or taxes presently if you move it from any sort of old retirement plan directly in to your new traditional IRA. The Roth IRA in its essence function, functions with regards to investments exactly the same as a traditional IRA. However, it has significantly different tax considerations. So anyone with earned income who does not exceed certain limits can add money into a Roth IRA. This is an account that does have limits for people to actually add money into it directly. So with that said, you do have tax-free earnings because you're currently paying the taxes on the contributions you're making into it, you also have no mandatory withdrawals. Since the IRS has already gotten their portion of your contribution, they don't require you at the age of 70 and a half to start taking money out of the account. A very attractive criteria if let's say you're getting a little bit up closer towards the age of 70 and a half, which is your required beginning date of mandatory distributions, is to utilize different strategies for maybe getting money into a Roth and then continuing to be able to add money in, grow that money tax-free and create tax-free revenue streams for your heirs going forward as well. So a very interesting thing to look at and I do have presentations specifically on Roths. So if anyone would like to get some more questions, please let me know. And the great thing is that let's say you're working past the age of 70 and a half with a Roth, you can continue to make contributions so long as you have earned income and you're underneath the threshold for, for income to make that contribution. Now, in the beginning of this little segment, I mentioned that you have income limitations as to being able to make a contribution directly to the Roth. Now, in the previous slide, we talked about the, the ability to always add money into a traditional IRA, but you're phased out of deductibility. Well, if you don't get a deduction, you can make that contribution into a traditional IRA and then convert it into the Roth IRA. So you can always make a contribution to a Roth, but there might be some additional administrative steps in order to accomplish that task. Now we're going to go over a few of the employer-based plans. You have your SEP IRA, your simple IRA, and your individual 401k. SEP IRAs really are more focused on people who are sole proprietors, maybe you're an independent contractor, subchapter S, a partnership, or self-employed individuals also uh, do enjoy these. And these two types of IRAs are going to give you deductibility more on the side of the actual employee because you're going to be contributing portions of your actual salary into it in a higher degree than you are with your individual 401k. So the main difference between these three different types of plans is that your IRAs are going to offer more of a deduction for those individuals seeking it on their personal taxes. And then the individual 401k would look to be a little bit more advantageous for people who want to have a bigger deduction on their corporate side because there's a profit sharing match instead of an, a deferral of your actual salary as you do have with the simple and the Roth. Okay, Steve, I have your question right here. Um, let's see. I like this question. Let's get one of these questions answered right now. So Steve asks, converting to a Roth from a basic IRA, wouldn't there be taxes and penalties? There are taxes, but there are not penalties. So anyone can take any amount of a traditional IRA at any time, regardless of income limitations, and then convert it into a Roth IRA. You'll get an IRS Form 1099-R that will state that you did a Roth conversion. The converse reporting will also be done on IRS Form 5498, showing that you had a converted amount. And then after you've done the conversion and paid the taxes, then moving forward, you have a qualified Roth account. There are many more considerations with regards to taking money out and the qualification of distributions, but essentially anyone at any income can always convert. You just have to pay the taxes, but you do not have to pay penalties because the money is staying within an IRA. So I hope that answers your question. And just mark that as answered. Okay. So moving on from the employer-based accounts, we're going to go into some of the contributions. 
the limits for 2016. Most of these contribution limits have not changed very much in the past few years. In fact, I do believe that the last change was in 2014 uh, for the cost of living adjustments. Uh, the traditional and Roth IRA both went up $500 for your annual contribution. So individuals under the age of 50 and one half can contribute up to $5,500 of earned income to a Roth or traditional. And over the age of 50 and a half, you have your catch-up contribution of an extra $1,000, bringing you up to a total of 6500 SEP IRAs, you're going to be looking at 25% of your base compensation not to exceed 53000 Simple IRAs, you have $12,500 of contribution, an additional 3000 of catch-up, and then a 3% employer match. Your 401k, you're looking at $18,000 of of, of personal contribution out of your paycheck, your elective deferral, add an additional 6000 if you're over 50, plus 25% of your employer match up to 53000 or 59, depending on your age. Education savings account have not changed in the past several years. They're still at $2,000 per year per child. And HSAs, if you have a qualifying high deductible health care plan, is $3,350 for individuals and $6,750 for a family. Getting into the actual mechanisms of moving money into an IRA, there are two preferred methods of doing so. If you have two like type of accounts, so if you have a traditional IRA and a traditional IRA somewhere else, a Roth to a Roth, SEP to SEP, simple to simple, et cetera, you can move them via a custodial transfer. This by far is the cleanest way to move money between two accounts because it is non-taxable, non-reportable, and you can do it as many times as you want a year. It just goes from one custodian to another. It's a simple exchange of money initiated by the receiving custodian. And it's a very clean way of moving money. However, if you do have an account that doesn't have the same name, let's say you have an old employer 401k, a 403b, a pension, or et cetera, you are going to need to do that via what's called a direct rollover, meaning that the 401k or other employer plan is going to initiate a distribution on behalf of that plan to the receiving custodian directly. Now, there is no taxes and penalties for this. However, there is additional reporting done and some additional considerations to make sure that you receive all of your tax forms from both people, because when you file your personal income tax statements, you will need to make sure that you send them the 1099 generated by the 401k administrator and the IRS form 5498 from the receiving custodian, making sure that you offset any taxable liability for that. So with that said, both of these are unlimited in the amounts that you can do per year, and also earnings are unlimited as well. So keep in mind that just because you have contribution limits, your earnings and your transfers are unlimited. So if you have $250,000 in an IRA, you can move that over without affecting any sort of your contribution limits. Okay. As I said before, you do have a very wide ability to invest in exactly what you would like with regard to your IRA investments. However, there are certain items that you cannot invest in. And then after this, we'll get into who you cannot invest with. The first item that the IRS specifically states that cannot be invested in is you cannot buy a life insurance policy for an IRA. One, an IRA policy is not a living, breathing entity. Two, the payments from a life insurance policy in most instances are always paid out tax free anyway, so it creates a cyclical environment of non-taxable money. So the IRS states that you cannot invest directly in that. Secondly, since everything with regards to IRAs is more or less based around the ability to accurately value it, then you cannot invest in anything that has subjectable value. So any sort of collectible item includes antiques, collectible bottles of alcohol, artwork, stamps, and coins. Uh, a good example that I will uh, steal from my colleague Larissa Green is that her husband has a large collection of baseball cards. Now, what are those cards worth to him? Well, probably a lot of money considering he still says that they are largely valuable and might go up in value to her. As she says, it's not worth the closet space that they take up in her house. So inherently use that example to kind of see why you can't invest in collectible items is that there really is no way to value it. And how are you to say on accurate reporting that something is worth something different to each person? So things that you're investing in need to derive their value inherently from a marketable standpoint of, you know, real estate is what the market will bear. Um, 
You can invest in certain coins though. However, they do have to be uh, for their bullion value only. Uh, gold, silver, platinum, and palladium are all allowable investments, but they have to be graded for bullion only. Okay, I have another question over here. We'll just take a small break before we get into the next one. Okay, Berlinda asks, if I contribute to a Roth, uh, to a Roth and my employer's 401k, does that count against the 5,500 amount I am allowed to put into a Roth per year? Good question. So your 401k contributions that you're making into an employer-sponsored plan are not going to affect your ability to contribute into an IRA outside of that plan. However, with traditional specifically, it might affect your deductibility if you have a employer-sponsored plan that you are making contributions into. Also keep in mind that if you are making a Roth IRA contribution, even if you have an individual 401k that has a Roth component, you cannot roll a Roth IRA into a Roth 401k, a Roth 401k can only be rolled out into a Roth IRA. Okay, so we've covered what you can't invest in. Now, who you cannot invest with. You cannot directly invest with the IRA owner being it yourself or your spouse. Lineal descendants or ascendants of you personally, so I cannot purchase or directly uh, do a business transaction with my mother, father, son, daughter. A business entity owner controlled by one of the above, and there's other circumstances with proportions of ownership that might disqualify an IRA investment as well. So this brings me up to a question put out by Steve. Can another LLC I own purchase real estate from my self-directed IRA? In this instance, the IRS would say no because your personally owned LLC would be selling an asset directly to your IRA or vice versa, which would be a direct personal benefit from you uh, to your IRA. And can my self-directed IRA loan money to another LLC I own? Uh, unfortunately not, it could not loan money to the LLC. However, one instance where that situation could work is that you could come together as partners. So even though you might be disqualified inherently by the rules of whom you can and cannot deal with, you can certainly make the deal work by partnering together. So coming in as partners on the same side of the closing table can make that deal work. However, your IRA could not loan money directly to your LLC in order for it to then in turn make that deal happen. But as always, you can certainly get creative with these things. And just because one iteration of the way you want to make a deal work doesn't is not allowable in an IRA, more often than not, we can kind of sit down and figure out a way to make it work that will allow it under the IRS rules. So thanks, Steve, for asking those two questions. Okay, some other Covering the other of the previous slide of prohibited transaction considerations, you are allowed to deal with siblings. You can deal with a brother or sister, so long as that you're making sure you do it on a fair market value basis. So the IRS, even though they do consider your spouse, your mother, father, son, daughter as disqualified individuals, they don't see that your brothers and sisters aren't. So with that said, if your brother has a piece of real estate, it certainly would be disqualified for him to sell it to your IRA for a dollar and your IRA turns around and sells it for 100,000. So if you wanna deal with family members, be very cautious when dealing with brothers and sisters to make sure that you always do it at a third party, right? so that you always do it at a fair market value rate. Don't get any sort of inherent discount just because of their familiar relationship. If you were to use any sort of middleman between yourself and the IRA to, let's say, you personally own a piece of real estate, you sell it to John Smith, John Smith turns around and sells it back to your IRA, that would be disallowable because the IRS looks at intent and they actually have legislation legislation, they have IRS codes that are written in what's called IRS 4975 called the step transaction doctrine, which does specifically address that type of dealing. So also in that same type of scenario, if you have an IRA that lends to B and then the IRA and then B IRA lends to A, if you make some sort of cyclical investment like that, where the ultimate goal is to circumvent the rule, again, they do see that as prohibited. So if you have an IRA, let's say, that lends money to someone and then the security on that note is a disqualified item, such as something deriving its value from collectability, although inherently the loan would not be prohibited, 
collecting on it in the event of default might create issues. So whereas you don't necessarily have to look at every single piece of security as disallowable if it's not just a piece of real estate, you just need to be aware that down the road there might be issues. So potential uh, solutions for that, maybe having a sale on default clause in the note or some other thing that would make sure that your IRA would not be taking possession of the collectible item in the event of default. So again, coming back to getting creative, we can typically make things work just so long as that we talk about ahead of time. Okay, now that we've kind of gotten through all of the basics and the initial steps of everything, we're gonna be getting into what everyone signed up today for, learning about private lending within an IRA. Uh, just because we don't inherently know who has what experience, we're gonna start a little bit basic, but the case studies will get a little bit more in depth. So why invest in private loans? There is inherent benefits to being able to market yourself as a lender to people that otherwise might be able not to find financing. Some great things about this is ours. You get to set the terms. So inherent in the note, the person with the money has the power. You are going to be able to set the terms that are amicable for both you and the borrower. You also get to determine your rate of return. So whereas with a open stock market or if you're doing any sort of other type of speculative security investing, you really don't know what the rate of return will be. You can certainly look at a past history of a fund or you can look at the potential growth of a company that's emerging into some sort of new sector, but essentially you're still taking a very big leap of faith in that type of investing. However, with doing a note, you are writing it out in paper, the guaranteed rate of return, at which point if there is default, you will collect on the security or otherwise pursue other recourse against the borrower. So you have a very high degree of being able to set what is acceptable to your IRA as with returns to the investment return. You have less liability than typically owning real estate. Um, I believe Pete Fortunato, for who anyone's familiar with him, actually said it's really hard to trip and fall over a piece of paper. I think that really kind of applies in this instance is that um, if you want to get involved in real estate but want to maybe decrease the exposure of your IRA, you could certainly lend and have the IRA hold the secured note as opposed to actually investing in the real estate directly where you are going to be exposed to liability and also needing to carry liability insurance and other expenses that would go along with mitigating that type of thing if someone were to slip and fall or something else. They also are inherently very low maintenance assets. Once the IRA goes through the process of getting everything drafted with regards to a note, mortgage, security agreement, getting a policy of lender's title insurance if applicable, you're going to have very low maintenance. Um, the, the mortgage on a piece of real estate is not going to need a new front door. It's not going to need a new driveway. So you're going to really be able to maintain a very accurate cost basis for this investment so that eight 12, 15, what have you percent that you're charging an in interest, you can get very specific with what returns you're going to get so you can do a very good strategic plan for your IRA investments. You can also partner your funds among other IRAs and individuals. So if you're trying to make a loan happen, you can certainly source out other individuals to help make that loan a reality. You don't necessarily have to have it all in one account. So you can partner with IRAs, other individuals. Uh, you can also partner with certain family members. You can always partner with the disqualified individual. Just remember that you can't transact on the same side of the table from them. Just to kind of break down what we've talked about in the previous slide is that you get to establish all of your note terms. Note terms for people that may not be as familiar with lending are you get to determine the amount borrowed. So the amount that you're actually going to be sending out of the account, whether you're going to be sending out 100, 50,000, 20,000, $1,000, you get to choose. You're not tied to a stock price or a market price or something. You're choosing exactly how much you're lending out. You're also choosing the rate of return and the interest rate. So how much interest you're getting on the money that you sent out. You're choosing the term of the note. So you're getting to choose how long that the note is going to be out and making, be, having payments being made on or an active asset until it is paid off. You're choosing the amortization and any sort of prepayment penalties that are going along with the note. Amortization means that is the schedule of payments that are going to be applied to principal and interest of the asset that you are lending out. And then if you have any prepayment penalties for them paying early, it can also be included in the note. If you're going to be doing some sort of equity participation, so you're going to be enjoying in the upside of the of the increase in value of the asset that is going to be done by lending them the money. That is certainly an allowable investment. And you also get to choose when you receive your payments. So individuals that might be on a fixed income or are looking for a uh, monthly return to uh, take out and use personally if they're 
of that age that they need to be t drawing from this, it can be really attractive investment for doing that because you can have a very well planned out uh, payment schedule for the actual IRA itself. So we're going to be getting into our first case study. Uh, I'm just going to leave one moment for anyone to type any questions in and get a quick sip of water. Um, if anyone has any questions on the basics before we kind of jump into our case studies, which will be the second half of this presentation that will take us through the rest of the hour, please do type them in at this time. All right, doesn't look like we have any questions, so we'll just go ahead and jump right into our case studies. So we're going to start simple and we're going to get a little bit more in depth. We're going to be covering different types of lending and different types of partnership deals as well. So for the first one, we're going to cover Paul. Paul has a former employer's 401k that's about $120,000, but let's say he's not making, oh, wait, we do have one question. Steve asked, does Advanta need to, oh, we have several questions. So before we do get into this, let me uh, just get into Steve and Jerry's questions. Uh, Steve asked, does Advanta need to approve the deal? Uh, it's kind of a two-part answer. Uh, insofar that we are going to be reviewing the loan documents to make sure that your IRA is properly titled, that all of our documents match with regard to your purchase authorization, that the correct um, funding location where we're sending the money, that the term and everything is agreed on, and that it includes all of the necessary requirements to make it a note, so an actual maturity date, a uh, rate of return, and a naming of the lender and the borrower or the promise to pay. Yes, we do make sure that that is in there. With regard to any sort of other extenuating terms and making sure that, let's say, a note or a mortgage is properly drafted for the applicable state and uh, more technical aspects, uh, no, we don't get into that far of the approval process. Uh, we are mainly looking to make sure that your IRA is properly titled on the asset and that your IRA is correctly funding the asset as well. So that is the extent that we do approve the deal, um, but everything else is, is certainly up to you to negotiate and uh, make um, amicable for the investment that you're looking at. So good question. Jerry asks, when IRAs invest in real estate, what method is used to substantiate the IRA value each year? It's not a, not a hard question to answer. It really depends on the type of asset. So if the IRA is investing in real estate and the IRS or the, and the tax assessor's value is in line with what you believe, the client can certainly provide our fair market value at the end of the year with the tax assessed value if they bought real estate directly. Let's say they don't, they can get a realtor to do a comparative market analysis and that's fine. But specifically to loans, what we're looking at for a loan is that if it's still current, um, if it's interest only, essentially it's pretty much a face value note. If it is amortized, meaning that there is principal and interest payments coming in, uh, we just need to see the updated amortization table of the loan on a yearly basis so that way we can adjust the principal balance and accurately report the value of the asset. Um, I do believe that answers uh, that uh, for the most part. Jerry, if you do have any other questions, feel free to type them in uh, and uh, we can kind of get a little bit more information to you at the end of this as well. Uh, Steve asks, if it's a checkbook account, do we need to get Advanta approval? Um, the answer would be no in the sense that if you're doing a loan after you've done the LLC, uh, the the onus on making sure that everything is done correctly falls to the manager of that LLC. Uh, to anyone that doesn't know what Steve just asked about by asking uh, for checkbook control, it is where the IRA would form a newly formed LLC and they would purchase 100% of the shares of it and then the actual management of the money and the investments would be done by the manager. So in this instance, we would just be looking at specifically the LLC initially making sure that the membership is properly titled, that it is manager managed and that it matches all of our forms and everything in this properly funded. So in that case, uh, you do get a little bit more control to um, do things at your own direction um, So as we are not actually looking at every individual investment. All right. 
Okay, so since we answered a few questions, uh, we're, our, I am going to jump into the case study. So please keep feel free to keep typing them in, and uh, maybe at the end of the next case study, we will uh, jump into a few more questions. So. With Paul's 401k, he has $120,000, but he's not happy with the actual returns that he's getting from his 401k. Maybe he's getting too high fees. Uh, for one reason or another, he has decided that he'd like to get involved in self-direction. So after looking through um, a bunch of different literature, he decides to open a self-directed IRA and use the money of his IRA to lend as a first mortgage, meaning that his IRA will be the most senior debt, will have the most clear line of uh, claim to the property if the terms of the note are not honored, meaning that if the individual who he lends money to does not pay, he will be the first in line so long as you know, taxes and everything have been paid to foreclose on the property and take that into his IRA. So Paul works with a mortgage broker to lend $120,000 to a borrower. Now, this can be any different type of borrower. You can lend to an investor. Um, obviously, there are some other consumer considerations that need to be made if you're lending to an owner-occupied property uh, with making sure that the mortgage is originated right. So making sure that you are working with the right people is also very important. Uh, so in this, uh, going back to, again, Paul is choosing all of these terms himself. He is making sure that he is absolutely satisfied with this. In this, he's going to be lending out $120,000 at a rate of 8% per year, and there's going to be a 5% balloon on this note, meaning that at five years, it will balloon and become fully payable. Monthly payment is $800, and he will hold the first mortgage on the property. So essentially, this acts in the more traditional sense as a certificate of deposit. You give the bank uh, a certain amount of money that you don't touch for a certain term, and then they guarantee a certain rate of return on that. So right now, although it is a rel relatively paltry 1.323% on most CDs, uh, you, you can kind of get the, the picture in that you are choosing the rate, you are you are lending the money out, and when it eventually repays, you will see the actual interest and the growth of that money from this investment. To kind of break it down a little bit, um, and I believe kind of uh, compound on the questions that Steve was asking, here's kind of the role that Advanta plays in the actual process of doing the investment. So in this instance, what Paul does is he opens and funds his Advanta account. He found the loan and then made sure all the terms were agreeable to him. He made an offer, he made a purchase offer, making sure that he uh, found the correct amount to lend out and everything was agreed upon, submitted everything to Advanta with regard to our forms for purchasing the asset, and then also read and approved all documents, meaning that he went through, marked everything as read and approved before sending it to Advanta for processing. In this instance, we review all the documents needed and make sure that the IRA is properly titled to actually hold the asset. We would wire the $120,000 directly to the title company or closing attorney's escrow account. We then would ensure that we would be following up with the title agent or attorney to make sure that the original mortgage and note are received by Advanta for safekeeping for the account. And after that, essentially, the purchase is complete. So after the close of escrow, the borrower would be sending money directly to Advanta for the principal and interest payments, or in this case, interest only. The payment is directly deposited to his account. So just like you would get a dividend from a stock or a payout from a mutual fund, everything is flowing directly back into the IRA account, growing tax-free in a Roth or tax-deferred in a traditional IRA. And then Paul would simply just log on to his account online and then track all of his all the statements and payments coming in, making sure that everything is being made on time to his IRA. So three years later, the borrower decides to sell the house. The property sells, Paul's IRA receives $120,000 from the sale of the property. Paul's interest will pay no capital gains tax, no accrued interest over the three years will be taxable as well because everything's being done within the IRA. So ordinarily, let's say outside of the IRA, he might be subject to ordinary income. He might be subject to short or long-term capital gains depending on how long he held it. 
Um, so you can avoid a lot of taxation in this instance, and it's always going to be tax deferred or tax free. And keep in mind, when you take it out, even if you are in a tax deferred traditional IRA, you're still going to be exempted from capital gains. So even if you made a significant amount of money in a short time, and then you took a distribution, if you're over the age of 59 and a half, you would still just only be paying ordinary income tax, and you would be avoiding a lot of other hefty taxes that could be levied on that investment if it were done personally. So one of the more popular methods that a lot of our clients um, recently have been utilizing is equity participation. Uh, we alluded to this earlier in speaking of the fact that you can participate in the upside equity of a deal while lending money out, maybe in lieu of getting a guaranteed rate of interest payment back. So instead of getting a 8% uh, uh, per annum interest on your actual money that you lend out, you would lend someone out money in this case, Andrea is lending out $100,000 that she had previously invested in mutual funds to do an equity participation note where she will actually be participating in the upside of the equity. So she initially is invest in, interested in joint venturing with people to buy fix and flip foreclosures. So she maybe doesn't necessarily want to get involved in the liability and the total expense of doing the fixes and flips herself in her IRA. So she probably was going to see it. She thinks that she would be seeing a better rate of return by working with other real estate investors in this type of loan. So Steve is looking for the loan. In this instance, if Andrea is the IRA account holder, she's performing all of her due diligence on Steve to making sure that he is a qualified individual and investor for her to lend the money to. She makes sure after she does the due diligence that all costs are paid from her IRA. So everything with regard to document drafting for it, any sort of um, security agreement that might be involved in this, keep in mind that you don't have to have a security agreement to do an equity participation note. Um, it is just something that is an extra layer of protection for your IRA. And then after she has done all of this and made sure all of those expenses are paid from her IRA, she offers to lend the $100,000 to, to buy and fix the property to Steve. So in this case, we have a loan amount of $100,000. You can have an interest rate um, or the other consideration could simply just be the actual upside of the equity of the property. So in this case, she has a interest rate of 5%. The upside of the property that she sees will be one third of the profits of the, of the piece of real estate when it sells. There's a two year balloon note uh, there's a two-year balloon on this note, and there's a monthly payment of $420. And in this instance, her IRA will be sitting in first position. So she will have the first ability to foreclose in the event of non-payment on this piece of real estate. So the actual note would be drafted by a qualified individual or her attorney. She would need to read and approve all the documents that are sent to Advana, and then complete our forms in order to actually fund this note. At the eventual payoff of the note, where we're going to see the actual um, equity participation in this, so that Steve is ready to sell the property for $130. Remember that we bought it for $100,000. He requests a payoff of the loan from Andrea. In this instance, Andrea is informally standing in as the loan servicer, where she's not receiving the payments and everything Advanta is, um, she is still certainly the one that would be providing the individual with the payoff amount of the note. And then the payoff, the payoff, once Andrea and Steve agree on it, is sent directly to the title company that's handling the closing. So in this instance, we have the repaid principal of $100,000. We have $2,500 of monthly payments. And then we had one third of the profits. So we had $30,000 in profits. Her IRA would be receiving $10,000. Her total earnings on this is $12,500. So she had the principal of 100,000 that was repaid plus 12,500 that she earned on that money in the time that it took Steve to pay off the loan. All right, Andy, just one second. Let me just get through this, um, the last part of this case study. We're almost done and I will certainly address your question. Okay. So in this case, the, the value for Steve in this is that he got the $100,000 to actually make 
the project happen. So he sells the house for 130. He had spent $2,500 on principal and interest on on interest payments to the loan. He also owed Andrea 12 owed Andrea $10,000 of the profits, which was 30,000. And so he totally earned on this net after everything $17,500. Now, in this instance, you don't necessarily have to use real estate as the security or the collateral for the loan. You can have it secured by a lot of different things. Um, you could have it secured by um, things that are inherently prohibited, but it could make collection of the debt difficult because you would have to include some sort of sale on default clause with that. Um, so typically most people will, if they're not using real estate, will do some sort of other type of security for that. Um, you could have it secured by stock in the company. You could have it secured by capital equipment, maybe an account receivable. Um, so there are many different ways to actually secure it and not necessarily all ways that would necessarily be the security of the equity that you're participating in. So the security could be, let's say, private stock in a company, whereas you're still participating in the equity of the, of the property being sold. All right, so before we get into case study three, I have a few good questions that I've gotten down here. So let's address those. Okay, Andy asks, what if there are progress payments are to be made while the house is being rehabbed? So I do believe that the, essentially that there's additional money that needs to be lent out um, to the, the borrower. Um, if I'm correct in, in reading that question right, um, you just need to do a modification of the note and then that might, you know, depending on the relationship between Andy or between Steve and Andrea might need to change the actual term of the equity participation in it. So if you are going to need to lend out additional money to the person borrowing from you, we would need to get some sort of modification to that promissory note. So that way we have an actual record of the additional principal being lent out. And if any other terms change, we also need to make sure that those are detailed within that as well. So with that said, that needs to be sent to Advanta because the modification agreement in in contrast to the note, needs to be signed by both the borrower and the lender. Whereas opposed to the note, the note is only signed by the borrower because that's their promise to repay your IRA. All right, Steve asks, can my checkbook IRA LLC open an account with Schwab and buy dividend paying stocks without Advanta's permission? What part does Advanta play? Well, with that question, typically you're gonna see a little bit easier of a workflow if you were to just have um, two IRAs, maybe one with Schwab if you wanted to do some traditional investing. And we certainly have clients that invest um, just like that, where they wanna do a part of their IRA uh, self-directed to help with their diversity, and then they keep part of it as a traditional brokerage. Uh, someone like Schwab typically, um, when they open up a corporate account, um, are going to you know, they're going to open it up and maybe are doing incorrect tax reporting if they're opening up as a corporate brokerage account, whereas the IRA is always going to be tax deferred or tax free growth. Um, you might have a little bit more of a streamlined ability to do proper reporting if you were to just have that money held at another IRA. Um, we wouldn't necessarily play any role in, you know, approving or disapproving any investment on the LLC side of things, uh, but you might have a little bit easier of a time with Schwab doing proper reporting um, if you didn't necessarily do it under your IRA uh, owned LLC. Okay, uh, Andy actually had a little bit of a um, addition to his question. It's part of the original loan to ensure the funds are being used for the rehab. Okay, so essentially it's um, a multiple draw note. We've, uh, I've seen this on a couple different instances. So you have a note for a total uh, amount, but instead of lending out all of the money at once for the rehab, you lend it out in increments. Uh, we can certainly do that. We like to be, you know, very flexible just because, you know, a note gets a little bit different than the traditional. Um, we can certainly handle that. Uh, we've done that in the past. It's just something that we would need to look at as a case-by-case -case basis and uh, get a workflow established for something that's uh, amicable to the client with uh, how we would handle uh, sending out additional monies. Um, but it's not anything that would necessarily raise your fees. It's just something that we would need to look at um, in that instance. But I've, uh, I've done that uh, specifically back when I was doing account management. Um, I had a client, just to kind of expound on that, a little bit of an additional case study. I had a client that was 
that lent money to someone that was doing a a manufactured home park in, I believe it was a little bit north of Atlanta. So the note was written up for $250,000. And every time that the individual would go through the first $30,000 of money lent out for doing things such as getting um, manufactured homes and trailers into the park to be able to be rented out and everything, um, we would actually send out additional funds. So he would send us a payment request and then we would send the money via ACH direct deposit to the borrower in accordance with the term of the note. This was all written into the note that there would be multiple draws and we work with the client to uh, get that workflow established. So it's certainly something that we can handle. Uh, great question, Andy. Okay. Case study number three, unsecured lending. So in the first two instances, we've covered doing a much more traditional type of lending where you are securing your interest in the loan with a piece of real estate um, or anything else like we just touched on. It doesn't have to be real estate. It can be capital equipment, private stock, uh, anything that you would essentially collect on in the event that the individual that you lent money to doesn't pay you. So that's how you secure your investment. So you don't necessarily have to do that. You can do unsecured lending. And unsecured lending can also be used in equity participation. It can be used in any number of other things. Um, so keep in mind, this is just one additional type of lending you can do in an IRA. Okay, Tom's loan deal. Tom has a SEP IRA. A SEP IRA is a simplified employer pension. It's a type of employer type IRA. He has $50,000 in it. And he has a friend that's looking to expand a business and needs some additional cash, short-term capital, to make this happen. He decides he wants to lend money out of the SEP, and he's willing to lend the money without collateral. So this is really where the hands-on approach of having a self-directed IRA comes into play, is that you are going to be doing the, or Tom in this instance, is doing all of the due diligence on his friend that wants to borrow the money to make sure that it's a good fit, that he's solvent enough to repay him, and just because there isn't necessarily security on it, that he still feels comfortable enough that he's going to get his money back along with any interest that's owed to him. In this instance, uh, Tom would have the unsecured note drafted, listing his IRA as the lender. The lender, uh, in this case being the IRA, needs to be properly titled in the name of the account, so that way it is actually holding the asset within the IRA. The note terms of this are pretty basic. He's going to have $50,000 because it's unsecured. You know, he's charging a premium on interest, so he's charging 10% with a one-year balloon, the lump sum payment of $55,000. So with a unsecured note, there are several considerations that you actually need to have. Because there is no title company involved, meaning someone that is acting as the escrow agent to make sure that the original note is signed and in possession and that the funds are distributed only after the individual makes the promise to pay by signing the note before distributing, Advana requires the original note in our possession before we will fund. Since the unsecured risking is riskier, uh, the interest rates tend to be a little higher. Uh, think credit cards. Credit cards essentially are just a big unsecured loan that you have. They're saying, hey, if you want to spend this much money, we will do it at 23 whatever percent interest rate that they're charging right now. Um, and you also need to make sure you really know your borrower because in the event of default, whereas with a mortgage, you can file a you can file a foreclosure with an unsecured note, your really only recourse is to go after them personally and personally sue them, which can get lengthy and cost a lot of money. And keep in mind that that is money that your IRA would have to pay. So your IRA would need to eat all the legal costs. It would also need to be employing the attorney and everything else that would go along with personally suing the person that didn't honor the debt that they had agreed to. Okay, I have one question, okay. Had a question, but it was answered. All right, getting into the fourth case study, seller financing. This one is really kind of a, a cool instance and in being really creative with a self-directed IRA because you don't necessarily always have to find someone looking to borrow and then lend them money. Your IRA, let's say it initially wanted Oh, actually, uh, I see Sergio had his hand raised. Uh, Sergio, if, if you do have a question, please uh, type it into the chat box um, as everyone is muted. I will get to it as soon as I see it, but I will continue on here. Okay, 
So with that said, maybe uh, Jim in this instance had originally wanted to buy the property. So he originally purchased a piece of real estate uh, with $70,000, uh, purchased it at foreclosure. Uh, he had acquired it at auction for 40000 bucks. Jim uses $10,000 to fix up the property, uh, and then he starts marketing the property to, to sell. So he ends up finding a buyer that'll buy it for $80,000 with $10,000 down. So he's financing $70,000 of the purchase. So in this instance, instead of the individual coming in, and I do apologize if this is going back, just making sure that everyone uh, understands it fully, if the individual does not want to get a loan, they can look to the seller to, if they own it free and clear, to finance the other portion of the property. So in this case, Jim is actually acting as the bank. Jim agrees to a loan amount of $70,000 of value on the property, an interest rate of 8% and a 15% amortization, meaning the loan will be repaid with principal and interest payments over the course of the next 15 years. The monthly payment of this actually will be $670, and Jim, instead of now owning the property, will own the first in line debt on the property, meaning that in the event of default, he is the first one to be able to collect on the, on the security, which is the property. So just as we've done before, just kind of a general breakdown of the two roles in this. We have, the, we have Jim buying the property at foreclosure, with his IRA, fixing up the house to put it back on market. He receives a down payment of $10,000, and then he finances $70,000 of that cost. So Advanta, in this instance, uh, we would actually have processed the original purchase of the investment property. Uh, we would also process the, uh, the subsequent paperwork for the sale and then the carryback or owner finance loan. We would make sure all of the titling and all of the uh, chain of titles were correctly um, uh, moved from the IRA to the individual buying the property and then also be tracking the loan payments when they're coming back to the IRA after the sale. So with this owner finance deal, Jim ends up with a monthly, monthly cash flow to the IRA without having to pay expenses. So whereas with the owner purchasing, with the IRA purchasing the real estate, he's going to be liable for taxes, he's going to be liable for insurance on the property, any sort of other types of things that need to be done to it, he's going to have to pay out of the IRA. With this, the IRA has essentially is now holding the note on the property, he's only going to be getting income without paying out any additional expenses. And also, he got the note at a discount. He paid $40,000 for the house, but got a $70,000 note on the property. That concludes our actual presentation today. I do greatly appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, just to kind of reiterate the three points that I do want everyone to take away from this is that any IRA or former employer plan can be self-directed. You get to choose the investment, you maintain control, and you have the ultimate decision on what you're investing in and what return is acceptable to you. And then all expenses are paid by the IRA, but you also get all of the, IRA, the, all of the income being received into the IRA as well. Here's some of my contact information up on the screen. Uh, before people start signing off, I did want to note, uh, notify anyone that is in our Tampa area or our Atlanta uh, area that we will be doing our upcoming series of brewing success events. Uh, we will be doing ours in Tampa at 610 Brewing in South Tampa. We will be having a guest speaker, a uh, tax expert. We'll be speaking to everyone on tax planning at that. And it will be general open networking, free beer, free food. So we would love to have you come out. Um, if anyone has any questions, I will be staying on for probably about another 10, 15 minutes until everyone signs out to answer those. Uh, conversely, uh, please take down my contact information. And if you have any questions in the future, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, I will certainly be happy to uh, answer those on a case-by-case -case basis because I do want to be a resource uh, for anyone out here that attended. Uh, but with that said, thank you for attending and uh, I'll stick around and answer any questions that people might have. Uh, Spencer, yes, I uh, have recorded this um, 
this presentation. And uh, so long as that you signed in with all of your contact information when you got into ReadyTalk, I will be sending out slides and we will be putting the recording on our YouTube page. So you'll be able to listen to it there as well. Uh, so I will certainly be sending that out.
All right, Steve, I got your question down here. Um, if I roll over funds from my 403B to Advanta IRA, is there a fee for the transfer to the bank? Um, good question. Uh, you would just need to complete our forms and then we charge just our purchase of asset fee once you, if you already have the, um, the asset purchased within the account. And uh, so long as that we're sending out a regular check, there is no additional fee for that. Thank you. Please stand by.